Surgeon Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Joseph Richard O'Leary, Jr., January 15, 1955, Brooklyn, New York. Okay, what was your educational background prior to entering service? I had a semester of college, high school graduate. Okay. Um, you enlisted? I enlisted. Why did you decide to enlist? Well, uh, Vietnam had pretty much wound down and uh, you know, I had my draft card in my pocket, but they weren't calling anymore. I sat out a year after high school and I went to community college for police science. And, you know, living at home, working full time, going to college full time, and socializing full time, I, I, I just didn't have enough time in the day. So I thought maybe uh, the military would help me get that discipline, that focus back, and if not, if not uh, help me get my college degree, at least get me a, uh, a job skill, mm -hmm. something that I could use on the outside. Actually, I actually applied for, I wanted to be a military policeman. I was taking uh, law enforcement or police science in college. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll maybe later I'll tell you a little bit about what happened from there. Okay. Um, why did you select the Army? Um, I've actually been around a little bit. I was uh, active duty Air Force in 1975. Okay. And um, when I got out, I was out three years and I came back and I got into the Army Reserve. And the Army has a particular attraction in that uh, a lot of upward mobility. It seems to be, speaking from experience, uh, I've got, like I said, Air Force active duty. I was also 12 years in the Navy Reserves as a CB. And the Army seems to have the most uh, upward mobility and to be honest, the most uh, positions available. So just uh, the sheer opportunity, I, I guess, is the best way to the best way to sum it up. So you were in the active Air Force first, then you went to the Army Reserves. Correct. I was in the Army Reserves for about three years. Um, then I moved out west and moved out to California. And since I, well. I couldn't uh, get into an Army Reserve unit out there, but I was able to get into the Navy Reserves and the Seabees. And I actually, uh, the Army took a strike when I when I was I got off active duty as a sergeant E4 Air Force sergeant. Three years later, I went to the uh, Army Reserve. They took a strike, uh, brought me back to the PFC. I was back to specialist when I moved out to California and the Navy Reserve actually brought me in as a uh, PO2, second, uh, Petty Officer Second Class E5, based on my civilian experience. Mm -hmm. I was doing construction work that brought me into the uh, construction battalion as an electrician, second class. Okay. Um, with the Air Force then, where did you go for basic training? Uh, Lackland Air Force Base, the gateway to the Air Force. Uh, the only basic training site they have, mm -hmm. San Antonio, and uh, very tough. The uh, you know no, nobody was getting hit or yelled at too much. They were kind of a little more politically correct, if you will, than maybe the Marine Corps or the Army basic training, but plenty tough. Uh, lots of ways to put pressure on people. They always had uh, ten or twelve people ready to try to get out of that enlistment at any given time, you know, just because of the mental pressure that they applied to our basic. Mm -hmm. um, How long was your basic? I want to say eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, have a specialization at all, or did you go after that for some specialization? I did. Uh, again, I, I wanted to be a military police uh, to, to eventually get into a police job. Back in uh, back in New York, when I took the ASVAB, apparently I scored uh, very well on it. And my recruiter either trying to fill his vacancies or really trying to look out for me uh, warned me that I'd be bored. 
as, a, as an MP. He said, you know, you're going to be waving traffic in at the gate, and you're a pretty smart guy, maybe you should try it out. And uh, I think he's really trying to fill a vacancy as an, uh, I mean, as an air traffic controller. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, quite a quite a challenge. But, um, my first airplane ride was to basic training. And uh, that was tough. Everybody said it gets easier from here. Well, if they thought it gets easier, they never tried to be an air traffic controller. <laughs> How long was that school? That was 20 weeks. Uh -huh. And I was at Keesler Air Force Base, Biloxi, Mississippi. And uh, my roommate, uh, Dad was a Lieutenant Colonel Air Force uh, C-135 pilot. And it, uh, he had a little advantage. He knew every plane in the uh, Air Force inventory and knew all about, you know, radios and navigational aids and everything like that. To me, I had to learn everything from, you know, principles of weather, navigation, principles of flight, aircraft characteristics. I had to learn everything from uh, Cessna 150s to uh, C-5, you know, Galaxy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. aircraft. So it was uh, quite the experience, quite a jam-packed 20 weeks. First day of uh, air traffic control school, the NCOIC gets out, looks over the class, about 60 in the class, and he said, look around, uh, nine-tenths of you, you're doing something else before you finish your, uh, your four years. About 10% of the air traffic controllers finish up. So that was, uh, that was my AIT. Mm -hmm. um, so you made it through okay? I made it through. I, I, I struggled. Uh, you had to learn to work the radar, and then you had to learn to work uh, what they call IFR, mm -hmm. instrument flight rules, without radar. And that was real tricky, just on timing and uh, flight progress strips, that kind of thing. And I got to go to Ramstein Air Force Base over in Germany, uh, air traffic control there for about two years. Uh, I struggled, even, even then. It, it wasn't my first nature, you know, it mm -hmm. just wasn't, uh, I wasn't really cut out for it, but I'd given it a, a really good effort, so the, uh, they offered me another school, and I went into, uh, I came back to the States, and I got to go to uh, telecommunications, te tele telephone equipment installation repair school at Shepard Air Force Base in Texas, and then uh, my, my last Air Force assignment was at uh, SEC headquarters at Offutt Air Force Base. So that was a much, I was better suited for that job. Mm -hmm. You know, everything was, came natural to me there. You know, a lot less stress then. Stress comes from not knowing, not being good at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. you right. know, Any some, close calls or anything? No, no, <laughs> no. No, we were always, you know, it's usually the one plane in the sky, mm -hmm. you know, five people to work it. When we got busy, we were about three deep mm -hmm. behind those radar scopes. There was, uh, all kinds of people assisting and doing the coordination, and you know. So when it got yeah, when it got busy, they 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 put someone else in. But it was great. It was a great experience. I worked it for two years, and uh, we had uh, the Cold War was going on back then. We we're actually moving a lot of uh, cargo uh, up to Iran, places mm -hmm. like that. You know, building them up for uh, military back when we were close allies. They. Um, we had we had a uh, strategic response force ready at all times. It was like uh, should the Soviet Union cross into our airspace? We used to call them bears. The Soviet Union air, you know, if a bear crossed into our airspace, we had a we had a whole uh, a strategic or a tactical launch plan in place. I think I had to do that once when I was on on position. Actually, clear a, a tactical departure for interception. Um, Ramstein was a pretty interesting assignment. Uh, talked a little bit about force structures and threat. That was Cold War. Uh, we were always told that the, uh, the Soviet bloc, East Germany, had basically 10 to 1 superiority on uh, tanks, conventional warfare. They had more tanks than we did. We were about a one hour tank ride from the border. But we always felt assured, secure, because we had A-10s, mm -hmm. and uh, we also had nuclear capability, superiority. So, kind of Did you live on base, or? 
Oh yeah. Yeah, I was uh, enlisted, not you know, mm -hmm. uh, single. So I lived in a barracks and uh, basically like living on an airport. I you had know, a rotating beacon, you know, like mm -hmm. a searchlight, and uh, pretty close quarters. Even though we 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 had total access to the economy, you know, we could go downtown, but they were German speaking and kind of a culture barrier, so you got very close with your, you know, fellow airmen, you know, the other, uh, so we had an army detachment out there, they were there for security, and we'd hear them run their, uh, their PT in the morning, we'd all be sleeping in because we were working shift work, and we'd hear the army out there at 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, I want to live the life of danger, I want to be an airborne ranger. And you never had to do PT? Heck no. Heck no, yeah. yeah. We never saw our M-16 again after basic training. It was, uh, now, as an air controller, what was your a day like? How, how many hours did you work on? How many off? And so on. Swing afternoon, morning, mid was our rotating shift. So you might do a couple of weeks of swing shifts, and then you rotate and you start coming in in the morning, 7 to 4. Yeah, uh, swing afternoon. At the afternoon, you'd have a short week. You could come in at noon, work to six o'clock or five, five o'clock in the afternoon, and then you had the mid shift, mm -hmm. and that was a couple of different shifts. Float, you know, rotating shift, floating shifts, and uh, kind of twenty, you know, seven by twenty-four Christmas and you know holidays. We we were on call. We were on duty. Try say on uh, call. We were on duty. So yeah, it was kind of a rotating, and sometimes you felt like you had just, you know, passed yourself in the, uh, in, the in, in the door of the RAPCON, uh, worked a radar approach control underground bunker where all the radars equipment was kept. And it was a pretty busy little thing. It was either boredom or panic. Because there wasn't a whole lot of mid ground. You know, it was either one plane in the sky or two planes in the sky, and you could, you know, the full timers or the uh, the people who had, uh, you know, the more experienced controllers would be a playing, playing risk, or you know, monopoly or something like that. And I could actually work the whole facility by myself, take one fl flight progress strip and work, uh, you know, scope to scope, and finally do the uh, the final landing, the PAR, precision approach radar, mm -hmm. and bring the plane down. Or, like I said, you're you're three deep, and everybody was, you know, I'd have two cigarettes going at once, and not smoking either of them, and, you know, a cup of coffee going. Was, yeah, every once in a while, you'd, mm -hmm. you'd, you'd get hopping. Now, did you get much time to tour the German countryside, or, or in that part of Europe, or at all? I, I think I, I think I uh, spent about four hundred dollars for a Volkswagen Beetle, you know, like a, I think it was a '67 Volkswagen, and uh, the 1500 engine. Did about 70 miles an hour in a downhill with a tailwind. <laughs> Almost got killed my first uh, first night on the Autobahn. Uh, Mercedes Benz was doing about 110 behind me in fog, and I pulled uh, pulled over and almost had a flatbed that I could barely see. Tiny little uh, tail lights on a flatbed. I actually had to hit the shoulder of the road and go around them on the right. So interesting. Yeah, every week. I can't say we were off every weekend, but. You, you generally get uh, two days off a week, and um, I got the tour, knowing the radar map pretty well. I like to uh, visit those sites, you know, you go to Heidelberg and Frankfurt and Munich. Uh, family came over and visited while I was there, and went over and saw Paris, and um, plus, you know, a little bit of Austria. Austria, that kind of thing. A family, this your parents? Yeah, 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 my mom and my sister came over and okay. was over and did a little tour and camped out in the Black Forest. And actually, the guys in Barracks, we used to uh, do a lot of skiing over in the Black Forest, a little town called Feldberg. And it was, it was great. And 20 bucks, you got your lift ticket, rival, and enough change for you know, some uh, hot chocolate. So it was a pretty nice deal. Did you buy a cuckoo clock over there? Several. <laughs> Nobody wants them either. You think they all want them? Yeah, they, yeah. They just can't wait to get them back. Here, this means more to you than it does to me. You know. So, yeah, there are a lot of maintenance. The cats like to play mm -hmm. with the with the little swinging levers and everything. Okay. Now, the rest of your duty was uh, as an electrician, then. Yeah, or te actually telecommunications. Telecommunications. Yeah, yeah. That that was a lot of fun. Uh, 
off, well, first at Shepherd Air Base for the school, they, they called us pole jocks. And what that meant was you had a, one of the first blocks of instruction was pole climbing, mm -hmm. and you had to uh, learn to ascend a pole with the called gaffs. And it's a boot, and you have your little leather harness and a spike come off the inside of your boot. And with that, you would uh, climb up the pole just with your hands and, and these uh, and these gaffs. And then uh, once you're at the top of the pole, you put your safety belt around the pole and uh, put yourself in a position, and then you could work at the top of the pole. Mm -hmm. and the final test, you had to drive a spike in with a sledgehammer, which was quite a timing event, you know, trying to pound yeah. this thing in with the pole swinging. And once you had it driven in far enough, you had to uh, circle the pole and get your wrench out and take the spike back out, put it all in your belt and descend down the pole. Uh, made it interesting was I blew my knee out about a week before I went to the school playing basketball at Offutt Air Force Base and uh, jump boots. I blew my knee out, but I was able to build it back up in time to go to the school. And then uh, falling off the pole is called burning the pole. And uh, saw a couple of good examples of that. One, uh, one female slid down a pole. Actually had wood shade, you know, wood splinters going up and uh, get into her underwear and everything, pretty bad scene. Uh, a friend of mine, a guy named uh, Liggins, actually, he's about 240 pounds, fell, his body dropped, but he stayed, and one foot stayed in, and is actually, the gaff was here, and his chin was on his heel of his boot, mm. and they were on their way up, and he actually was able to Scoot himself back up and get back onto his feet and got down. So it was pretty dangerous work. Yeah. Uh, you had to be able to do that, and then you went on to the electronics phase, and then you know, learned about systems and options of the telephone system. But you had to be able to climb that pole. And to be honest with you, I think I might have climbed one more pole in 20 years. But you had to be able to. You had to know what you were doing, mm -hmm. be able to, and not be afraid of heights. So what were your assignments after after this training then? Off it. Uh, SAC headquarters was oh, the underground, right. yeah, uh, Strategic Air Command, yeah. and uh, that was kind of neat. You had half the shop maintained the base, which was pretty busy. We had uh, Air Force Global Weather Central was there, and an underground they provided weather for basically the country, probably the entire military. Uh, you had a lot of other things, and then the other half of the shop. Uh, just worked right in the underground at the Strategic Air Command. And that was a lot of planning, top secret clearance, that kind of thing. Anytime you walked into the uh, different office spaces, they would have to cover all the tables. This is all uh, need to know. Mm -hmm. Anybody had the clearance, they, they still covered everything. Every time you drilled a, drilled a wall, you'd have to call the alarm company. They were very uh, conscious of security. They actually uh, used to have us install special devices to call them ringer isolator kits because they're so so afraid of eavesdropping. It was like electronic countermeasure for just for telephone conversation that they could actually tap a phone even though the phone was on the hook. Somebody could even actually listen in just on the bell of the phone on the old old the old style phones. So it was a lot of it was interesting. It was good good work. Uh, both bases were were rank heavy, lots of generals and colonels and like that, and uh, you know a lot more than E ones and E twos running around. It was a staff heavy assignment. Why did you uh, leave the Air Force and and not uh, stay in? Well, uh, that was my original plan. I was going to do four, uh, get a job skill, get back out. I think my Conservative staying in, I didn't want to do. I didn't want to. I didn't want the the rotation to having to uproot my family. Mm -hmm. I intended to have a family. I actually got married while I was at off at Air Force Base. I had my first child right before I got out, and I didn't like what I saw the what called the lifers, the, the career servicemen who had to ro uh, relocate every three years. It was mm -hmm. typically a three-year tour. 
and some people were able to extend and stay on longer, but typically it was three years you had to PCS or uh, change, change a station. And I, I didn't want my kids to have to go through that. Uh, it's funny because as it turned out, when I got out, I wound up living in Sioux City, Iowa, Omaha, Nebraska, Long Beach, California, uh, you know, Colony, New York, Saratoga Springs, New York. So we wound up moving quite a bit anyway. But that was my concern, was, was the moving. And uh, you also used to hear a lot about um, you know, class distinction, the officers, the enlisted. You know, your kid goes to school, he's an enlisted, mm -hmm. he's a sergeant's son. You know, less than the officer's son, you know, or daughter. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. That, 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 was, that was the reality, though. Mm -hmm. That was, or at least a perception when I was on active duty, was that there was a lot of class distinction. So, I don't know. I, I thought four years would be enough. Uh, unfortunately, when I got out, besides from moving around a lot, I also didn't land up. I, I figured with all this telephone experience, I'd get grabbed right up by uh, Ma Bell. But on, on the outside, uh, things were slowing down there, too. They were in a downsizing. So I wound up uh, not getting it with Verizon or Ma Bell. You know, and I had to do quite a bit of moving around to find a good position, you know, even with those uh, Militarily acquired skills, those mm -hmm. job skills, it was still tough to, to get a good job. Now you said you were in Panama. Well, that was that uh, while you were in the Air Force, or it was actually in the Navy Reserves. Navy Reserves. Okay, we can get to that then. Um, <laughs> why did you go back in in the Army Reserves then? Uh, okay, I, I was out three years, and um, when I got out, 1979, Omaha, Nebraska. The job I was able to get paid four dollars an hour, and doesn't sound like a lot of money. It wasn't. It really wasn't that bad though, because I was able to buy a home, twenty-three thousand dollars. I bought a house in Sioux City, Iowa, making my four bucks an hour. And every whatever it was, every three months, I was up for a review. I'd get another quarter, you know. But eventually, I was pushing nine dollars an hour, but. Uh, it was a, you know, I had three kids for three years uh, in a good job. I mean, I was a cutting edge technology wise. We were putting in electronic and digital telephone systems, but the money was pretty, you know, pretty small. And I thought, well, if I go back into the military, maybe uh, gain some of that managing, management experience, some of that leadership skills, more of that. So. Uh, and the money, you know, the extra 250 a month wasn't a, wouldn't be a bad thing. So I went back and uh, talked to a couple of different recruiters. The Air, the Air Force wanted me back, but they had kind of changed my job description so much that I would have had to go back to a complete school. They would have had to formally train me again, and I didn't want to leave my wife and kids mm -hmm. for a, another, you know, 16-week school or anything. So the Army decided that they could uh, put me right in as a tactical field wire specialist with my telephone experience. Like I said, they took a one pay grade, brought me in as an E3, and, um, but I had, a ball. I, I had a wonderful time. I was in an artillery unit up in uh, Sioux City, Iowa, 3rd and 14th Field Artillery, and the mission there was to protect the Alaskan pipeline in the event of war. And, uh, I was in with a great group. They had uh, not really Vietnam veterans, but just guys my age, for the most part, but one had just come back from uh, active duty in Germany. He had a lot of experience laying the field wire. You know, I guess back in Germany, he used to lay wire out with out of helicopters, put it right across treetops and that kind of thing. So he had a lot of skill, a lot of experience. And with my telecommunications uh, training, I was able to. Uh, assume position of squad leader and I've always I was always in scouting and that so I like the idea of you know the big whack and camping out a lot of field time we got to Fort McCoy and then it was all cold weather training January, February, that, that type of thing. I think I went on three ATs with them up at Fort McCoy. Um, then I moved down to Omaha, Nebraska and I actually uh, got into an armored cav unit 
I got a nephew of another MOS of 19 Delta Calf Scout. And I did, I did one AT with them in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And then soon to become a drill sergeant. That was the job progression there. Was you went to, to one AT, you, you got certified on the, uh, the equipment, which was the uh, armored the uh, armor personnel carrier, and then uh, you had to learn to be an instructor and all the other counseling. You, had, you got what they call a hotel designator. And then you become a, an instructor. The next step is to go back and push troops. You get to smoke through the bare hat and be an actual drill sergeant. And before that occurred, I, I moved for uh, my civilian appointment to move me out to California. And that's Kind of broke from the Army Reserve there and got into the Navy Reserve. So. And what year was that about? Uh, probably 85. So 82 to 85 was in the Army Reserves. And then I switched right up to the uh, to the Navy Reserves as a construction electrician, second class. It's in a unit called uh, ACB 1, Amphibious Construction Battalion. They were a rifle company. And the saying was, we build, we fight. So you had to, you had to uh, learn your construction skills and learn to work within the other rates or the other uh, construction trades. So we'd actually, we could, we could build a base. We could build a small, you know, uh, a base with airstrip and, you know, right up. And my part of that would be to lay the, uh, the electrical service from generators, distribution, I could go uh, either buried manholes, conduits, or I could go aerial through telephone poles and that kind of thing, uh, and actually pay out an entire you know, power, an entire village, or an entire uh, base, if you will. Uh, and I also had, um, I had to learn the communications, radio and telephone. We could do, you know, move from a commercial telephone system, again, through distribution, cable splicing. So I got a lot of training, a lot of experience there with more on the distribution end and the generation side of telephone and, uh, and power. Now you stayed in there how long? I wound up doing about 12 years, 12 years with the CBs. I got promoted to E6 in California, and I came back to New York. I got stationed up in Albany and it was uh, ACB 2 and Amphibious Construction Battalion 2 and actually a, a Naval Mobile Construction Battalion, uh, NMCB. There was an NMCB 12, NMCB 13. Uh, one was Davisville, Rhode Island. They, and then they started shutting down bases, a lot of the downsizing that we went through mm -hmm. uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Uh, and, that, and that pretty much limited a lot of my uh, promotion potential trying to make E7 was very tough for me because uh, on the outside I'm a telephone man but in the reserves I was an electrician so it was kind of a stretch anyway and then uh, the positions kept being eliminated through the downsizing so we were going like I said uh, Davisville Rhode Island got shut down um, it might have been through the, the Reagan years and then uh, they moved us to Groton, Connecticut. It was a sub base down there, but we had the, uh, the CB's battalion headquarters was in Groton, although we, we continue to drill in Albany, North Main Street, and Washington Avenue. Uh, eventually, that got changed. We came, uh, went up to NMCB 13, the, the Black Cat Battalion. That was down at peak skill. And then they uh, decommissioned that, and then we became a CBMB, a Construction Battalion Mobile Unit. And it was pretty uh, high speed, it's one of these 72 hour uh, uh, mobilized units. We had uh, updated shop records and you know all our training skills and everything were kept right up to date so that we could mobilize in short, you know, short mm -hmm. order. Uh, with, was with that unit that I went to Panama. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, the, um, it was kind of funny because first I was scheduled to go to, uh, where the heck was it, 
Orlando, Florida. They're calling it Operation Disneyland. We were just going to, it was going to be a vacation, two week uh, construction project in Orlando. And, you know, plant plenty of uh, R&R &R and, you know, hanging out at the bars and everything. And they went to the, I went to my monthly drill, the next drill, and they said, uh, who wants to, who wants to uh, help out? And they needed some bodies to go over to Panama. So I quickly volunteered for that to, uh, I figured I could always go to Orlando. Well, you know, when was my next chance to be, you know, to go to Panama? So about two months after that, we started hearing a lot about Strongman Noriega on the news and what we we're going to do about this guy. And I knew I was going over. And uh, but as a reservist, they actually weren't going to let me go. They weren't going to let us go in as a reservist. It was uh, uh, considered too hot in the area. They actually had zones numerical codes for the for, for restriction, active duty only to reserve as well. I kept I kept going, you know, as far as getting my shots up to date and I had to take different uh, different kind of uh, tests to you know, medical uh, screening to make sure that I was uh, able to be deployed. And I, I kept that all going and hoping that they would clear it for reservists, and they, and they eventually did. I think I went December, right after they had captured Noriega, and I got to go over there for two weeks, and uh, one of the best ATs I'd ever done. I uh, slept on a barge out on the canal, and right across from right across from us on, 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 on the, the dock was Noriega's two boats that they had captured, uh, Macho Man 1, Macho Man 2, and they were you know, some nice cabin cruisers that he had used, and people were allowed to tour those, and I never did, did the tour on that. But it was a good two weeks. It was still a little dicey, and they were, they were still patching up the bullet holes in all the buildings in town from the war. And actually, I think the last Friday night we were there, the, uh, our leadership put a curfew, said everybody be back at 10, and a bar that a lot of the guys had gone out to a place called My, uh, My Way, they left there at about quarter to ten. The place got bombed at eleven, so I'm still a little risky. But uh, I got to—I uh, didn't go to my way, but uh, we did take one of the uh, the government trucks. This old uh, they call them red line truck. It was you know no spare tire or anything. It was, looked like a like it was ready for the junkyard. But we took that on a tour. We went uh, basically followed the canal from, from, from one port to the other, from one end to the other, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And it only took about an hour, two hours of driving. It was a nice little tour and toward the locks on both ends. And it's a good time. Good time. Actually, uh, another funny story, a couple of our reservists were on the outside world with police officers. Three three of these four guys, one was a construction worker and the other two or three were police officers and they got pulled over by the uh, PDF. The Panamanian Defense Force, and were being taken downtown because they were the police. They were very, I would say, corrupt. There was a lot of corrupt, corruption going on, and they were trying to, I don't know, pull something over on our reservists. And uh, well, our guys, our guys reported what happened. They, they, they basically, as cops, they, they started looking, saying, "Is he got a?" Is he, is he armed? You know, is he, is he carrying? As they as they as they put it, is he packing? And they realized he wasn't. So at the next red light, they let him out of the car, and they uh, made sure to cover themselves. And they told the uh, leadership the next morning what happened. And they made the uh, they made the, the base newspaper. Uh, it was basically a reprimanded, but they, they they couldn't buy another beer while they were there because everybody was kept wanting to buy them rounds because uh, everybody had been so abused by these. Uh, Panamanian uh, police force. Yeah. So, anyway, hmm. that was Panama. Okay, um, you were in the Navy Reserve until '97, you said? Yeah, roughly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I was coming up on right then, I had about 22 years of service, but because of all the moving around out in the Midwest, like some years I'd have two ATs, the next year I might not have any ATs, you know, all the drills, but no. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I didn't have all the retirement years. Plus, I had a, a acquired two years IRR when I got off active duty. I I picked up two years of uh, service 
that weren't retirement years. So uh, at the end of my Navy career, I was like a year short for retirement. And there was, they have what they call a higher tenure. You, you're allowed 22 years service as an E6, 24 years service as an E7, and then they're going to push you out even though you're reserve duty or reserve status. Uh, so I was going to be real close. They hadn't pushed me out yet. They hadn't really began processing that, but I knew that it was, you know, on uh, on the agenda, and it was probably coming up sooner or later. But because of my skills, my civilian skills as a uh, telecommunications technician, and I was up in some high high tech. Data communications at this time. Now you were with MCI? MCI Wellcom, right on the outside. Mm -hmm. And I was working a lot with uh, Chief Tiffany from the New York State uh, Army National Guard headquarters, doing his telecommunications work over in uh, Troy, Glenmore Road, and South Lake Armory. And the CBs were actually working for them, uh, doing some office space. And I was doing a lot of consulting for the Army National Guard advice on what kind of cable to run for the, for the communications and the data communications. So I had those, can, those contacts, so I talked to Mr. Tiffany about uh, the possibility of switching from the reserves over to the Army National Guard, and he set up an interview with uh, a couple of the Sergeant Majors, Louis Hoff and uh, Sergeant Major Hoff. And the other sergeant major there, but they... Uh, it wasn't Martell, was it? Yes, it was, Keith Martell. Mm -hmm. And they were uh, they were impressed with, with my background and thought <coughs> I'd be able to contribute. So I was able to keep my rank, still E6, uh, moved over to the Army National Guard as a telecommunications technician for a piece called Stark, the headquarters, and able to help them roll out their new uh, communications plan for networking their telephone systems at the Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, New York City. And that, that pretty much fell in line with what I had done for the last 20 years, a you know, civilian contractor with uh, Executone and later on with the MCR WorldCom. Are you still with them? Or actually, actually uh, what happened was I was up for E7, but I I was up against a lot of competition, people who had Army experience from day one, and a lot of my Navy time and my Air Force training, I can't say my time didn't count, but my training wasn't given the same credit as Army training. They, they shall we say, respected Army and Marine Corps training. And even on the CBs, I've been to Camp Lejeune Squad Leader School. I've been to their, their arms training, small arms uh, uh, coach type schools at Quantico, Virginia. I wasn't given promotion points for that training. So uh, I, I was up against a lot of competition at the headquarters as, to, to move up as a 74 Delta uh, communication or computer technician. But uh, because I had so much field time, I was offered a position as a uh, platoon sergeant for the 105th Infantry over in Schenectady, first of the 105th Infantry. Uh, went over there as a uh, sergeant first class platoon sergeant. And uh, they were gearing up, they knew they had to uh, do a, a JRTC and a Fort Polk, and they, they had just lost their their platoon sergeant, the combo platoon sergeant. So I was able to take that position, and I did uh, did a couple of ATs with them. The one the big one was the again it was about three weeks long JRTC Fort Polk, Louisiana, and that's funny. I, I lost 10 pounds, and I think about 10 years doing that thing. I felt about 10 years younger. Let's put it that way. Because I was there in July and August, and I. They spread my, they spread my platoon. My platoon consisted of about six guys. I had two. I had one guy who was about ten years older than me. He was a Vietnam era Marine cable splicer. He was my, what I call, uh, he was my squad leader. 
uh, Messack, Walt Messack, and uh, he was a real piece of work. He was about 58 years old, and you could hear him from about a mile away. Great little sergeant to have working for me. Uh, and another guy about as old as I am, he, both of them were stuck in E5 positions, and because of the way things were worked out, there was really no opportunity for them to move up to E6. I came in as E7 over them. Well, anyway, uh, we went out to Fort Polk, and they both had companies that they were put over. And uh, I was at the battalion headquarters with, uh, with the captain, Captain Seeger, I think his name was, and, uh, and one specialist. So uh, what I did was I just divided the workload up with, uh, between myself and the specialist for the, for the headquarters, for the battalion headquarters. And we just, you know, divided up morning and, uh, and evening shifts for, for maintenance of the network that we had out there. Kept going. Like I said, uh, you, you couldn't keep the uniform dry. I, I was going through about uh, three camel bags of water, about a hundred ounce uh, bag of water on my back. I was going through three or four of them a day. And uh, you put a uniform on, ten minutes later you'd be soaked, soaked to the skin. Very hot, uh, very busy. Work for Polk. Anyway, so that was the 105th. That's where I got E7. And then, um, uh, I was pretty well trained up, and then the 9-11 happened, uh, 2001, and MCR WorldCom was going through a Chapter 11 uh, restructuring. They were going, uh, they, MCR WorldCom was big on uh, um, mergers, hospital takeover, all that kind of business, and they had bought the company I was working for, EMI, Eastern Microwave, later intermediate communications, so many mergers and everything going on in that business and MCR Wellcom got involved and uh, I had a good job. I was a suit and tie position there to program management as a network manager over the state police network and the uh, fiber optic uh, network that the state was, was, was putting in. Actually my military affiliation being a reserve, being the National Guard helped a lot with uh, the state, dealing with the state uh, customers, if you will, because many of them were prior service military. The uh, state police network manager was an uh, active duty Marine during Vietnam. And I uh, had a very good working relationship because he knew I was, I was a member of the National Guard. Mm -hmm. So it went very well in my favor. That, uh, like I said, 9-11 happened and I was looking to do more for the military. I really wanted to deploy, and um, MCI was going through problems. I was really, you know, worried about possible layoffs and everything there. And uh, Master Sergeant Tara Bessie, who was the NCIC over the recruiting staff in Schenectady, visited the telecommunications office during the drill weekend. He was trying to uh, recruit some of my E5s to become recruiters. So I told him uh, I'd like to talk to him after, and got one of his business cards, and pretty soon he had me set up for a board with uh, Sergeant Major Oliva, Sergeant Major uh, Galusha, to become a recruiter myself. And uh, within half a year, that that happened. You know, I came a, uh, I came in as an E7 as a recruiter. I did about a year in the field as a as a recruiter. And eventually, uh, was moved up to the headquarters in Waterville Arsenal as a uh, IED team manager, initial active duty training manager for the Army National Guard. So that was uh, you know, about 900 uh, soldiers a year. We ship off to basic training and advanced individual training, and I I got to manage that. I got to uh, work the liaisons at Fort Benning, Fort Jackson, Fort Leonard Wood. Fort Knox, you know, wherever we had soldiers in training, if they had any problems while they were training, or if the family had any problems while they were away, I, I dealt with the liaisons from those bases to to assist assist our soldiers through that. Uh, recently, uh, been promoted to NCOIC in recruiting, so now I'm up in uh, Glens Falls Army. I have an office in Glens Falls, and a 
satellite office here at the Saratoga Armory. And I've got 10 recruiters working for me right now. Or I will have by the end of the year. I'll have 10 recruiters. We've got a, an area from the Canadian border down to Latham, from the Vermont line over to Route 30. Is our area. Out of all the positions you've had, what, what one or ones do you think you, you like the most? Well, I, I can honestly say I've never had a bad job mm -hmm. in civilian or, or in the military. And to be honest, uh, probably I have to say that the, um, the artillery, the call weather unit, all the call weather training, that was a great group, great training. Uh, yeah, it was so self-contained, so self-sufficient, and a great uh, you know, the esprit de corps there. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of togetherness, good, good close-knit unit. Our captain at the time was a, uh, he had been an enlisted man, junior enlisted over in Vietnam. He had just had a great attitude. You know, he really trusted us. He, uh, empowered us. You know, as a specialist I felt like I had so much authority and you know he, he just really put a lot of faith in in us and uh, it, was, it was a great great team, great great training and uh, again I, I just I've always loved the outdoors and getting a chance to you know, go up in the middle of Wisconsin Dells and work for McCoy is top of the Mississippi River and just being up there in the middle of the winter and I just I just loved everything about that. And well, the National Guard, I've gotten some really quality training uh, here. Um, I did a radio school when uh, Y2K came about. The, uh, there was all this concern about losing the power grid, mm -hmm. losing the communications grid. And the state headquarters sent me and uh, several others up to was it Delaware. Base, but it was a radio school, Bethany Beach, Bethany Beach, and they had uh, actually trained us up on a AM radio. It's a VHF. Uh, it's because of the characteristics of uh, very high frequency radio waves, you are able to maintain very long distance communications, you know, around the world. Mm -hmm. Basically, there's a network of uh, HF radio. It's not VHF. It was HF. HF radio, you could actually uh, communicate through a through a network, regardless of wire. You know, you didn't need any fiber optics or any kind of copper. All you needed was the the radio, and you know, we had battery backups and generators. And we would have been able to maintain worldwide communication. So I got to go to a, a great school down here in Bethany Beach, and not to mention it was about a mile from the boardwalk and you know always like the ocean so it's just an ideal school so you, know, you got to really expand your knowledge and it was, you know again it's just a nice place to be with 9-11 were you ever assigned to new york city or on, for duty or anything uh, my son was i uh, again i i went ahead and preempted it all i they couldn't move fast enough for me. I, I really wanted to go, uh, like, November 12th. I, I was, you know, loaded bags, and, you know, I had my toolbox with me and a box of wire, and, like, come on, you know, come on, Colonel, let me go, you know. And, you know, it was Captain Sergeant Major and the uh, battalion commander and the XO. They went down and did a survey, and it was pretty much covered by the city units. And we were basically told, you know, there's three months where we were on a short note standby, but nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. And then I, I went to recruiting. Once mm -hmm. I was recruiting, it uh, considered a, let's say, a, a critical mission recruiting. So actually did what do you find are the challenges of recru recruiting now? Well, right after 9 11, there was a real patriotic surge. And mm -hmm. Everyone was. Uh, you know, wanting in and, you know, trying, because everybody loves the idea of protecting their own homeland mm -hmm. and we were attacked on our own ground, on our own country. Uh, just, it was a natural, you know, rush to, to, to join and returning people, right? But over the last four or five years with all the deployments,
Lights to Iraq, um, you know, the six o'clock news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a mixed. Now it's rather than just universal acceptance. Now there's a lot of people, that, you know, opposed to what we're doing. And so it's 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 a tougher sell. There's still a lot of you know young people want to do it, but the parents are so concerned. And I mean, I I can relate. My wife, my mother, my three sisters. Every time, you know, some dictator out there. Uh, you know, causes us to, to deploy, you know, to, to go, to, you know, families put a lot of opposition, and I think that's what we're dealing with the most is the families who are concerned for the, you know, but it's still, I mean, one of the, 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 the greatest, I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the, one of the greatest impressions that was ever made on me was my active duty career over at, uh, Ramstein Air Base, and I, and I worked with a master sergeant there, and he had actually served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and um, I always respected his, his opinion and, and what he, what what he taught me, which which I remember now that I'm the, the old guy, I'm you know 51 years old, and is that. Americans, their youth are always going to step up to the challenge. You know, our soldiers are always going to meet the challenge and exceed the uh, expectation. You know, regardless, is always we always think that the, the next generation is too soft and mm -hmm. the, the generation before us weren't uh, cool enough or smart enough. But really, uh, it's, it's the American way that we seem to always replenish, and the next generation steps up, steps up. And, how long, much longer do you think you'll stay in? Uh, well, God willing, another eight and a half I could do. Um, six to let you stay till 60 years old. And um, I'd love to do it anyway. I mean, every, every day is better than the, the last. I enjoy every day. Of, you know, this is probably the one of the most rewarding jobs I've ever had recruiting change someone's life to, to give them a chance you know for their future and uh, I'm 51 I can stay to 60 and also uh, monetarily it's it's building my retirement because I told the MCR Wellcom with all their uh, you know nonsense they wiped out our uh, 401k plans and everything else so all those civilian jobs it's just like I bounced around from the Navy and the Army Reserve and the Air Force, I think people are doing that as a whole right now in the civilian world. Mm -hmm. There's a, you know, there's no more getting in and working for GE for 30 years. Because mm -hmm. too many people are moving around and, and that kind of happened to me on the civilian side. So uh, my retirement on that side is, is garbage, but luckily I, I stayed in the reserves and I have something to look forward to when I when I reach age 60 and uh, again I can stay in the I'm an AGR now I have to guard reserve I can stay and do this for another eight years I'll walk away with uh, basically a 22 year active duty retirement so it's, uh, it's nice it's a lot better than uh, a lot of people have to look forward to mm -hmm. how do you think I think you've kind of answered this your time in the service, how, how has it changed your life? I've always been a pretty patriotic. I mean, I feel like I've been in since I was six years old. I was a, you know, a Cub Scout when I lived in Brooklyn. I moved out to uh, Lake Ronkonkoma as an eight-year-old and got right into Boy Scouts mm -hmm. and Explorer Scouts and, you know, wanted to be a police officer. My grandfather was a police officer. I felt like I kind of grew up in that. but. Uh, you know, being being in the Air Force and uh, it's 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 really you know, I've met some of the, some of the you know best people and uh, you know, learned a lot. I, I feel like my life has been really rewarding. Uh, the work that I've done has been meaningful for the most part, and uh, yeah, I couldn't uh, I can't complain at all. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the interview. Thank you.